What you're about to hear are episodes 6 and 7 of my new podcast, Camping Horrors, where I narrate true and scary camping and hiking stories. Because when you're out on those trails, you're not alone. There are demons that follow you home, unexplained creatures that want to ingest you, and psychopaths who think hiking means closing the distance between them and you. If you like what you hear, leave Camping Horrors a rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. For more scary stories read by me, check out Unexplained Encounters and Tales from the Break Room on your favorite podcast app, or just go to eeriecast.com. Thank you. If you want me to narrate your scary camping or hiking story, share it with us at darkstories.org. Now, throw a log on the fire, because the night is still young. Unexplained Sounds at an Abandoned Campground On a muggy late summer afternoon in Georgia, my husband, our six-year-old son, and I decided to go camping. Instead of opting for a paid camping ground, we sought something a little more off-road. We'd heard about an old camping site that had been closed down, no longer attended or maintained. Curious, we decided to check it out. Upon arrival, we found the gate to the old check-in booth chained shut. This meant we'd have to park our car in the wood line and carry our belongings in on foot. After a short walk, we began to spot old campsites, overgrown picnic tables, fire pits, etc. We continued searching for a spot near the pond, so we kept walking until we found the perfect spot. It was about a 15-minute trek from our car. That evening was simple, and before long our son was asleep, while my husband and I sat by the fire, no one around for miles. The silence was a bit overwhelming, but suddenly it was interrupted when we heard about six loud, heavy bipedal steps coming from the water's edge. It was like the sound of someone stepping out of an inner tube in the water, then taking several heavy steps onto shore. My immediate thought was that a park ranger or police officer had found our car, located the campsite, and was about to ask us to leave right away. Had the sound resembled any animal, such as a deer, muskrat, beaver, or bear, even though we shouldn't have bears in our region, I believe we'd have instinctively identified the approaching animal. This was heavy though, deliberate, more intimidating than any animal could be. My husband, a tough guy, not easily rattled, sprang to his feet, feeling defensive and genuinely afraid. My blood ran ice cold. We shone our flashlights into the woods, instinctively grabbing a nearby pocket knife and stick. We waited in silence for whoever it was to approach. Strangely, no officer showed up announcing their presence. No deer darted in front of us. Just silence. That's when true terror set in. I assumed that someone with malicious intent was hiding and waiting for the right moment to attack. I quivered out a shaky, hello? Just like in horror films right before a gruesome attack, I'd never felt such primal fear. Still, there was only silence. But then, we heard branches cracking, not on the ground, but overhead, all around us, rapidly and loudly. Pine cones fell to the ground, echoing the snapping branches. It sounded as if a hundred squirrels had suddenly ascended the trees, going mad. And yet, no matter where we shone our lights, we saw nothing. The noises continued for what felt like an eternity. We stood there petrified, unable to do anything but listen and wait for any sign of movement. It was as though we were being toyed with, sounds coming from above, below, in the trees, in the water, from every direction. No animal sounds, no growls, grunts, or squeaks. The noises and their patterns were not natural, normal, nor recognizable. I felt completely cornered. All I wanted was to wake our child, hold him in my arms, abandon our belongings, and sprint right back to the car as fast as possible. 
However, we were a good 15 minute walk from the car. I could hardly move, let alone run into the dark woods with this unknown presence. It all became a blur, but I remember we went back to the tent, huddling inside with our son, waiting for whatever would happen next. The noises kept going, loudly surrounding us without a break. Sometimes they would be nearby, other times far. Sometimes loud in the water, then in the trees. What kind of creature or entity could be on land and in the water within seconds? What could be so loud yet remain unseen, or be present in so many places simultaneously? It was becoming maddening. But that was the extent of it. Terrifying, unexplained sounds. We never slept, waiting for daylight to make our escape. Shortly after sunrise, the noises ceased entirely. Finally, we went down to the waterside, looking for footprints or other evidence of what could have caused all those sounds. We found one puzzling thing, a large tree trunk from a fallen tree, which appeared to have been stabbed or shredded with no natural patterns or signs of wildlife. It was like the tree had been repeatedly stabbed and gouged with a very large knife, leaving deep gashes and splinters. These cuts were fresh, and they definitely hadn't been there the previous day. In the light of day, we left, still without any idea of what that had been that caused those sounds in the woods. Perhaps there's a reason they closed that campground. Years later, it still baffles me. I've been unable to rationalize or explain it away. It was something very, I'll just say, unnatural. How a birthday party can go wrong. From Gianna. This happened about three years ago. I'm 17 now, but still, I was traumatized after this happened on my birthday. I live in a small town in New Jersey. I had about nine friends. I was about to turn 15, and I was getting ready for my birthday party. I was very excited. I decided I wanted to have it at a cabin in the woods. So my mother arranged for us to have a small cabin in the middle of the woods where we'd have access to a kitchen, a living room with a TV, three bedrooms, and a bathroom. It was going to be so cozy and peaceful. My mom helped with the decorations before my friends could arrive. We hung balloons, streamers, and string lights to give it all cottage core vibes. By the time we finished putting up the decorations, I heard knocks at the door. I went to get it. My cousins and friends had arrived. As soon as I saw my best friend Ernesto, I gave him a tight hug, then welcomed them all inside, saying, you're all just in time. As soon as we got settled, Mom ordered up some pizza. After chowing down, we all huddled together, telling stories. Sometime later, my mom told me she had to go into town, but she was a bit hesitant, worried about leaving us all here alone. But I assured her that we were all older, and that we could take care of ourselves. I promised her I would check all the doors and windows, making sure everything was locked down. Once my mom was convinced, she left, and we all went out to start a fire, cooking up some s'mores. We were having a great time, telling some scary stories by the campfire. One of my friends, Jessica, started to tell this true crime story about some sort of female serial murderer, we were laughing and giggling, hiding the fact that we were actually a bit scared. But then Ben told us that his mom and dad got a divorce. We felt horrible for him. We asked what happened. He said they decided to get the divorce after he came out as gay, while his mom was supportive. His dad wasn't so much. After they split, his dad constantly harassed him and his mom. His mother got to the point where she had to file a restraining order against his dad. As Ben explained the story to us, he was nearly crying. Just in case, we asked him what his father looked like. He showed us a photo. 
A little while later, after the tension settled down, we began to hear loud crunching noises coming from the woods. Keep in mind, we were in the middle of nowhere, and the next neighbor to the cabin was like a mile away or more. Ernesto gasped. What the heck was that? I answered in as calm a voice as I could muster. Maybe an animal. Alan, the bravest of our group, said, I don't think so. I've never heard an animal walk around like that before. It sounds like a person. I started to agree with Alan. It really did sound like two legs walking around, not four. We tried to focus again on making s'mores, but that's when my cousin Ruth began telling another story. We were so interested in the story that we forgot about that sound. Until we heard it again, it sounded much closer now. We all got creeped out to the point we had to go back inside. We all power walked towards the cabin. As soon as we all got back in, I locked the doors behind us, making sure the deadbolt was locked in tight. As soon as we all got inside, we decided we should watch a show before bed. We decided on some anime on Netflix. After watching a straight season of something, we all decided to go to bed. Six of us got the beds upstairs and downstairs, while the rest of us four slept in the living room. That included me, Ernesto, Jessica, and Ryan. We slept downstairs in the living room. Before going our separate ways, we wished each other good night. Then we headed to bed. My three other friends already went to sleep while I was still on my phone, scrolling through Instagram. Eventually, I felt my eyes getting heavy. Once I felt a bit too tired, I plugged my phone into the charger, and I drifted off to sleep. I may have been asleep for just a few minutes, when loud banging at the door woke me up. All four of us were awake. One of us had to see who was at the door, so I decided to be the one to check it out. I think all of our hearts were pounding. This cabin was a bit old. It didn't have a peephole, so I couldn't see who or what it was through the door. The rest of us decided not to wake up the other friends, as we didn't want to creep them out. We were all positive, or just hoping, it was probably just an animal or a stray dog. But the direction of the sound changed, moving towards the window, specifically the living room window. Someone began tapping very hard on the window pane. I got down on my hands and knees, carefully going to look out that window. I pulled back the drapes just a little bit so I could see outside. What I saw made my body freeze up. I was face to face with a very tall man who was probably in his fifties. He was shirtless and nothing but boxer shorts. He wasn't even wearing shoes or socks. He was holding what appeared to be a hunting rifle in one of his hands. The moment he saw me, he smiled this creepy, big smile. He also waved at me, as if he was taunting me. He pointed at the front door then, as if telling me to let him inside. But right away, I recognized who he was. It was Ben's dad, from the photo that he showed us. I dropped the curtain back and ran to my cousins and friends downstairs. I told them what I saw and who was outside. They were all just as freaked out as I was. We all ran up and went to get the rest of our friends upstairs. Ernesto, Ryan, and I went to wake up Alan and Tim in the room next to Kai and Ben's room. We told them there was a crazy man outside the window. They were scared then too. When I said crazy man, they all jolted awake now fully on guard. When Kai and Ben asked who was outside, I was hesitant to say, but eventually I relented. Ben, I'm pretty sure it's your dad. I saw Ben's face change into a horrified expression, and I saw that there were tears filling up in his eyes. He started to have a meltdown. Jessica and Tim tried to comfort him, including Kai. Some of them were a bit skeptical, asking me if I wasn't dreaming. I assured them I was fully awake and aware of what I saw. The moment I said that, we heard a loud, hard bang on the door 
along with a voice from Ben's dad, saying, Let me in, kids. We were all so scared, standing still, not knowing what we should do. One of us, or some of us, had to go downstairs to get one of the phones to call the police. We decided it would be best to go down as a group. Ben's psycho of a father already knew that we were in the cabin, but we didn't want to let him know our location within the cabin. Tim went to grab his phone. You're probably wondering, did we look for weapons to defend ourselves? Well, yes, that's exactly what we did. The rest of us were ransacking the closet, looking for something, anything to defend ourselves with. Jessica and Ruth took out two chopping knives from the kitchen. Ben got some pepper spray he found in his bag. I found a metal bat, and Ernesto grabbed a pocket knife from his back pocket. Tim, who was tasked to call the police, said that the service was spotty and that he was having trouble getting through. I told him to hold on that I would check my phone. Before I could even get to the living room, we heard a loud banging from the front door again. Ben's dad was trying to kick it down. After several more kicks, he kicked a big hole in the door and screamed he was going to kill all of us. The rest of my friends were all screaming. Before he could unlock the door, I ran over and approached him. I sprayed him in the eyes and nose with the pepper spray we had. His dad jumped back and screamed in pain, yelling all sorts of curses. Ben swung open the door and yelled at me. Gianna hit him! I picked up the metal bat, swinging as hard as I could on his dad's head. His psycho dad fell on the ground then, not moving. We all ran back upstairs. We all worked together to barricade the door to one of the bedrooms. I remembered that Tim still had his phone... I asked to let me see it so I could dial 911. Luckily, that call managed to get through. I told them our situation, our location, and how many of us there were. The operator told us to stay in that barricaded room until the police arrived, that they would send a few officers to the scene. We hung up the call, but we realized that the door was so damaged that the psycho could now come in and nothing was stopping him. We sat in that room for what felt like an eternity until we heard sirens in the distance and we could see flashing lights from outside the cabin. There were about five police cars outside. Luckily, the sicko was still unconscious when police arrived. They took him away in handcuffs. When he woke up, he found himself in a cop car. The police then greeted us, asking us to give a statement. We told them everything we knew, everything that happened. They made sure we weren't injured. We were all untouched, luckily, but quite traumatized about what happened. It left us very shaken up, and we all wanted to go home. The cops stayed with us at the cabin until our parents came and picked us all up. Like I said in the beginning of the story, we live in a small town, and it didn't take us long for us to hear the news. We found out that Ben's father had somehow found out that I invited Ben to my birthday party at the cabin, and he had actually been planning to kill him and all of us. According to the police report, he was also hyped up on illegal substances when he tried to break into the cabin. Today, Ben has now been seeing his therapist, but I thank him and myself that day. If it wasn't for our quick thinking and reactions, we wouldn't be alive, and I'm so glad we made it out of those woods in one piece. Beware of Joker From Sinister Sadie It happened back in the 90s. I was 15, a freshman in high school. My friends and I decided to go camping for a night out at a friend's parents' property, the Creek House, as we called it. In those days, we didn't really hang out in the house. We mostly just camped in the creek bed on the edge of the woods. It was a mixed group of about five or seven guys and as many girls. We were a pretty tight-knit group of kids who were more into partying than we were with sports. 
but I was sober on this occasion, which was a pretty rare thing in my teen years. Someone had decided to bring the Ouija board camping. I don't remember whose board it was exactly, but it was the one that made the rounds with us at various hangouts. It was pretty late that night, and we decided to bring it out. All the girls were already asleep, except me and a girl named Shannon. There was also a couple of guys that were still awake, but they weren't paying any attention to Shannon and I, as they were all in Trip City with their buddy LSD. Shannon and I lay down on our stomachs on a couple sleeping bags by the fire and got the board out. We asked it if anyone was out here, and we quickly got a reply. The planchette spelled out J O K E R. Oh, hey, Joker, I said out loud. What's going on? The planchette moved again. It spelled out K I L L Y O U. Kill you. Being idiots, probably thinking the other was moving the planchette the whole time to prank the other, we didn't take the warning seriously. Instead, I decided it would be a good idea to taunt the supposed entity. Oh yeah, I said. And how do you plan to kill us? Shannon and I laughed. The planchette moved. T-R-E-E. -E. What? How are you going to kill me with a tree? I scoffed. No sooner had those words left my mouth, part of a branch from a large oak tree above us came crashing down and landed vertically like a stake between my legs. We screamed, but we didn't stop playing there. Instead, we calmed down and moved to the other side of the fire, laying back down. Yeah, it was scary, but we just had confirmation that perhaps this was real. We felt compelled to keep going. Stupidly, I asked, Well, that didn't work. Now how are you going to kill me? The entity spelled out then, F-I-R-E. As soon as we read the word aloud, the campfire nearby grew and popped, flames rushing from out of the fire towards us. That was enough for us to say goodbye to the entity, leaving that Ouija board alone for the rest of the night. But my story doesn't end there because Joker followed me. Later that summer, my sister and I were hanging out in the back room slash living quarters of our stepfather's shop with our friends, Mandy and Linda. We had two sets of bunk beds in there with a stepladder to get into the top bunks and a bare concrete floor below. It was the afternoon, and Mandy brought out the board. We asked if anyone was there, we got a reply of yes, so we decided to ask a few questions. Just silly things teenage girls ask. Then eventually, one of us asked who we were speaking to. My heart raced when it spelled out Joker. Playing confident, I said aloud, Oh, you again? Still trying to kill me, huh? The entity pointed to yes. I wasn't messing around this time, and I immediately went to goodbye. That was the end of the session. We put it away and went outside to hang out with some other friends. That evening, my sister went home with her mom because she had gotten into trouble over something, so it was just me staying in the back room on the bunk beds alone. I was dozing off to sleep when I suddenly was jolted wide awake. I was terrified when I saw them. Spiders, hundreds of spiders, had built webs from the head of the bed to the foot, completely encasing the top bunk I was on, and one was coming down from the ceiling towards my face. I quickly rolled to my side and out of the bed, forgetting I was on the top bunk. Somehow my reflexes took over, and I was able to catch myself just before I hit my head on the stepladder. I switched on the lights in a hurry, and when I looked back, there was nothing there. Not a single thing. If I hadn't caught myself falling out of that bed, 
I could have broken my neck on the stepladder, and no one would have known until morning. I refuse to even be around Ouija boards to this day. Be careful taunting those that reside beyond the veil of our world. My hunting experience was one to remember. From Null. This all happened back when I was 15 years old. I'm 18 now, but I've never shared this with anyone before. My family and I have always been active hunters, and we do it every year. We harvest our normal animals, deer, rabbit, squirrel, hog, and I've always been the one who hunts the hogs. The best time to hunt hogs is at night, and it's perfectly legal. Well, one night I was in our blind, hunting hogs. I saw a deer and a few raccoons. I watched them eat for about 15 minutes. Then the deer left, and the raccoons were all that was left. I was starting to get bored, when all of a sudden, the raccoons ran off, like something had scared them. I thought maybe an owl had landed nearby, startling them. But I also noticed it was quiet. A little too quiet. I mean, it was completely silent. This was very unusual and creepy. I had my night vision scope, so I started to move my 45 70 rifle around as to scan the woods. I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but there's a creek that's about six to seven feet deep within our shooting lane. We essentially use it as a berm for our fired rounds in case the bullet goes all the way through the animal. As I scanned the area around me, I come across the creek, but something's off about it, because I could see eyes shine. I get my hopes up, assuming that it's a hog, so I get ready to fire. As I do, the thing I'm looking at starts crawling up the side of the creek, with hands and a human-like head. I then watch it get to the top of the creek, and began to walk to the corn we had set out for the hogs. This thing had the body of a man, but it was covered in fur. I instantly knew what I must be looking at. A Bigfoot. Now, being the fearless 15-year-old I was back then, I readied myself and got into shooting position. I aimed for its chest and started to pull the trigger. Boom. The rifle fired. My ears rang. I was excited. No way, I thought. Did I just bag evidence of a Bigfoot? But over the ringing in my ears, I heard and felt a gut-wrenching roar. I looked through the scope again and saw nothing. I decided to wait until morning to see if I had hit anything. Morning came, and I left the blind to investigate what damage I'd done. I went over to where I'd shot. I found traces of blood. I followed the trail, which seemed to go on forever. For all of two hours, I followed it. But then, I heard the roar again. And when it stopped, I heard something hard hit the ground. Again, then again, and again. Something was throwing things at me. Not just things, though. Rocks. Huge rocks. I quickly turned around and left the woods before one of those huge rocks crushed my skull. It took me an hour to get back, but I was terrified. I still hunt, but now I use an AR-15. It holds more than the 7-round tube in my 4570. But I don't hunt at night anymore. U.S. Army Veteran and the Wendigo in Kansas. From Sea Philly 100. I was riding a ski lift with a U.S. Army veteran just last week. We got to talking when he mentioned that he'd spent the last couple of years living in the South Dakota Badlands. I asked if he'd ever seen any Sasquatch out there, based off my friend's South Dakota Sasquatch encounter. He said he hadn't though he was tracking bison and coyotes through the region at the time in order to better understand their hunting patterns. He did, however, relay a story in which he truly felt he had a close call with what might have been a wendigo 
in Kansas of all places. There's an old Native American Union Army trail that goes through Kansas, and my new friend here, as well as a buddy of his, had been hiking along the trail, enjoying the annual bird migration there, when, all of a sudden, everything went deathly quiet. That's when he started hearing the sound of a woman screaming bloody murder, and although his companions somehow could not hear it, the sound seemed to reverberate all throughout the hills. I think my buddy thought I was losing it, he told me. But we both heard it go super quiet, which was odd in and of itself, as we were smack dab in the middle of a massive bird migratory route. The Kickapoo live in the area presently, as a reservation was granted to the tribe back in 1832. And though it was progressively reduced over the years, part of the tribe has continued to live there down to present times. He said he'd never been more certain that someone, or something, was trying to lure him out into the dense brush to kill him. What was odd, though, was that his friend couldn't seem to hear the screaming, even though it was crystal clear to his ears. I asked him if he happened to see the creature or pinpoint the location of that screaming. Not exactly, he said, though I continued hearing weird sounds and noises, and when we camped out that night, that's when things got really bizarre. We hadn't seen a soul for at least two days, and that night I was on high alert, so I had a tough time falling asleep. Every little sound had me poking out of my bivy sack with my 1911-style 45 pistol, scanning the area for any signs of movement. What was really creepy was at one point, he said he thought he saw a tall, dark shadow move from behind a tree to another, and possibly what might have been a hand reaching out around the tree before slowly retreating back into the stillness of the night. When he finally did fall asleep, his dreams were plagued by nightmares, of him trying to escape some unseen assailant while running wildly through the brush, cutting his face and arms up against the bramble. He'd finally made it back to safety in the dream, at which point the dream would simply start over again, as if on repeat. This happened for what felt like ages, before he woke up in a cold sweat, going right back to scanning around the perimeter. At long last, day broke, and the sun gradually began to rise. They packed up their little camp and didn't have any run-ins with this entity, though the experience had clearly left him shook. It wasn't until the video game Until Dawn was released in 2015 that he remembered that experience and wondered if that's what they'd encountered on that backpacking trip so many moons ago. In her book, American Monsters, Linda Godfrey states that the Chippewa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi tribes in Kansas believe there is an evil man-eating giant human who was turned into this terrifying beast due to some slight to another or through a variety of sins. The Chippewa believe that selfishness, gluttony, or cannibalism would turn a tribe member into the Wendigo as punishment. Descriptions vary from tribe to tribe but most describe a large elk-like predator that preys upon people who wander too far into its domain. Many report hearing sounds like a baby's cry, a woman screaming, or a voice playing on a static loop of sorts, perhaps a phrase the beast somehow recorded from previous victims, typically something to the effect of, who's there? I need help. I'm lost. Is someone there? Please help me. I'm hurt. Basic human instinct might lead one off into the wilderness in an attempt to help whomever they think is needing assistance. Another common theme is hearing the voice of a loved one, maybe your mother, luring you out into the woods alone, or even a familiar form appearing in the mist, followed by the gradual realization that their voice is off or that the form doesn't quite fit the supposed dimensions of a human being often too tall, too slender, arms too long, a stance more suited for a wild animal than a human person. All these possibilities the two of us discussed, while also bringing in other native folklore, such as Deer Woman, 
or shape-shifting witches, all of which are relatively common motifs in the mythology of the region. But what do you think it was? Bigfoot in Indiana from Danny Joe. The year was 2015. My best friend Scott and I, along with his oldest son David, went fishing at Morgan Monroe Reservoir. We'd all go every year for an all-night trip in August. I would meet up at Scott's and load my fishing gear in his truck, and help him load his so we could get started sooner. I looked forward to the trip every year. It was a way for us to decompress from a long week of work. Scott's son, David, was starting his senior year and was eager to get done with school. At the time, I was only 28 years old, and I told him, enjoy life now, because adulting sucks. Scott and I had known each other for over 10 years at that point, and we'd worked together for the same amount of time. Our friendship was more like a brotherhood, and we always had each other's backs, treating one another like family. As we started our drive to our favorite spot to fish, I mentioned to Scott we needed to stop and buy more bait. He shook his head in irritation, so I asked, You alright? Just want to be down by the water sooner rather than later. I thought you bought bait already, Scott replied. I felt bad about it, but what can I say? I'm only human. We stopped at a small gas station in Martinsville and got some worms and other miscellaneous things to use as bait. We loaded back up and made our way, listening to some good old ladies' music, all three of us excited to catch some fish. From the gas station to the reservoir was about half an hour, but it felt like a lifetime. As we finally pulled into the grass, there was a sign that said closed due to animal attack. The trail we had to walk down to get to the water was covered in shadows as the sun was starting to set but we didn't care about that or the sign. Both Scott and I carried firearms when we were not at work, so we were confident that we'd be safe. We grabbed our gear, making our way down the trail with haste as we were so eager to start fishing. As we set up everything, all three of us started talking smack on who would catch the most fish. David was the first to put a line in the water, proclaiming he would outfish us, but both Scott and I scoffed, quickly throwing our lines in the water too. After a few hours, we were all having fun, talking about random things like cars, girls, and work bullcrap. At one point, David stood up, telling us he would be right back as he had to go pee. I told him to take a flashlight. It was dark, and I didn't want him to get lost. David took a light and disappeared into the darkness, Around the same time, though, we started to hear this knocking in the distance. A knock, knock, knock. This put chills down my spine, but then the thought crossed my mind that it was just David fooling around with us. As David came back, Scott asked, Hey, could you not be an idiot out here in the middle of nowhere? David replied, First, what are you talking about? Second, who was making that knocking sound. Then the knocking noise started up again, louder than before. Knock, knock, knock. I stood up, grabbing the flashlight from David. I pointed it in the direction of the sound. But I didn't see anything that way. And then, suddenly, something large landed very close to where we were sitting. I pointed the flashlight toward where we thought it landed. The light traveled across the grass, and then I saw it. It was a large rock, somewhere between 10 and 20 pounds or more. Scott was starting to worry that maybe someone was messing with us. But David told him this didn't seem like something a person would do. David asked, Could this be a bear? He had fear in his voice, and I could see it in his eyes too. No, no. I'm pretty sure bears don't knock around or throw rocks. I was starting to get worried myself. I got my firearm out of its holster and readied it to fire if needed. The knocking and rock throwing stopped for some time. 
so we thought maybe it was over. I looked at my phone to see it was almost 3 o'clock in the morning, but it didn't feel like it. Another knock, knock echoed across the woods. Then the most disturbing sound came after. The only way I can describe it would be a mix between a howl and yell. The noise was way too close for comfort, and it gave me goosebumps in an instant. I asked the other guys if they were ready to leave, and they both said yes almost at the same time. We started to pack up then. Then another rock was thrown. It hit the ground right next to us. I nearly soiled myself then. Scott grabbed the flashlight, pointing it towards the sounds again. This time, about 30 to 40 yards away from us, between the trees, we spotted a tall, dark shadow. This shadow was almost seven feet tall, with reddish-yellow eyes. David asked, Can we just leave, please? He was beyond scared at this point. Scott looked at me, and we both knew this wasn't a person. It wasn't a bear, either. The knocking and rock-throwing continued. We walked pretty fast down the trail, which was parallel to the water's edge. We had almost 100 or more yards to go before getting to the truck. But then there was a kerplunk, followed by a splash right next to where we were. It sounded like whatever was out there had just thrown a huge boulder instead of a rock. All three of us stopped in our tracks, looking around to see if anything was getting closer to us. Heavy footsteps were moving and sounded like whatever was making them was in a hurry. Even with the flashlights, we could barely see a thing. David spoke up. Do you think this is why the area is closed? Scott and I did not reply. We just kept walking. We heard glass breaking ahead of us, which only meant one thing. There was someone or something at our truck. Our hearts beat so fast at that point, I think adrenaline carried us the rest of the way. Scott and I both had our guns out, and we were ready to use them if needed. We kept hearing more and more noises. One noise we heard was a loud screech, like something was dying. I asked Scott then, does the remote start work from here? He reached into his pocket, grabbing his key fob. At that moment, we all got a whiff of the foulest scent. It was like a horrid cross between rotten trees and wet dog. To me, that felt like whatever it was should be very close. So close at that point that I heard low growls just ahead of us. A loud crash and a knock right in front of us as if something was slamming one tree against another. At last, we made it back to the truck. All four windows of the thing had been smashed in, and we discovered what the screeching noises had been. I opened the tailgate, only to found what used to be a raccoon, smashed up and bent and broken, horribly dead. It was a gruesome sight, but we were in panic mode, we all piled into the truck, and Scott started it. When the lights of the truck came on, they illuminated the woods in front of us. There it was. This blackish-brown, over-seven-foot-tall thing. If I didn't see it with my own two eyes, I never would have believed it. It was real, and here in Indiana, the first word that came to mind was Bigfoot. A Bigfoot was standing about 15 yards in front of our truck, with a huge rock in its hand. It had a very angry look on its face. This thing, this Bigfoot, was showing no signs of backing down. Scott began backing up, slowly at first, but the moment that creature began to come towards us, David screamed. Dad, go faster! So Scott put his foot to the floor, and we sped out of there. There was then a loud bang, which caused the back of the truck to move a little. But we kept on driving. We drove the whole way back home, not saying a word, our eyes wide. I can't even be sure if we blinked at all. We pulled into the driveway of Scott's house, the floodlights over his garage coming on. We stepped out, looking at the truck closer. There were dents, 
scratches, and the broken windows, of course. We looked in the tailgate. There was now a huge rock in the back. That loud bang had been that Bigfoot throwing this huge rock at us. Scott looked at me and finally spoke. Was that what I think it was? I replied, I think so. David, at this point, wasn't saying anything. He seemed to be in shock. Scott tried to tell his wife what happened, but she didn't believe him. She thought he'd been drinking and wrecked the truck. I told my wife about it all, and she laughed at me. This really happened, but it seems like no one cares or wants to try to believe us. Next time we go fishing, we'll make sure not to ignore any signs posted, and we'll stick to the safer side of things. It's 2023 now, and we still haven't been back to that fishing spot. I often wonder if that Bigfoot has ever attacked anyone else. Stalked in Rural Oregon From Anthony K. I was around the age of 18 when this happened. It took place in my hometown in rural Oregon. The town's name is Elkton. Not like that matters. You've probably never heard of it. The place has a population of less than a thousand people and consists of a restaurant, a bar, a store, a park, and a post office surrounded by scattered farmland. Nothing bad ever happens there and everyone knows each other. At this point in my life, I was pretty lazy. I didn't have a job, no car, I still lived with my mom, and I smoked a bit too much. Basically, in my own opinion, a certified loser. My routine was sleep in until I felt like waking up, get stoned, and play video games. Once I got bored with that, I'd walk over to my buddy's house, and we'd hang out for the rest of the night. I'd usually hang out there until around 1 a.m. For reference, I lived about two miles out of town, and my buddy lived in town. It was a bit of a hike, but it wasn't bad, and it was probably the only exercise I was really getting at the time. I would just pop in my headphones and zone out till the walk was over. This happened during one of those nights when I was walking back home. I was walking through town on the main road, I had my headphones in, and I was just vibing while I made the two-mile trek. As I approached the park, I noticed a car sitting in the parking lot. It was weird at first, because usually I didn't ever see anyone else on the walks. The whole town would be asleep during these hours. I shrugged it off. Maybe it was someone passing through. Maybe it was someone taking a nap or something. Just off the road by the park, is a trail that leads down to the river. At the start of the trail, there's a bench. As I approached the trail, some random guy abruptly appears from the trailhead. This guy looked to be in his early 40s, judging by how he dressed and his facial features. One thing was strange, though. He was wearing aviators, and this was at 1 a.m. He power walked in front of me and sat down on the bench, the whole situation was strange. It looked like he was just staring at me the whole time. I was freaked out at first, but stupidly shrugged it off. I just started walking, diagonally, so there would be some distance between us once I passed him. I passed him and looked at him, and he was still looking at me. I took out one headphone and kindly said, How's it going? I think that was a bad move. He did not reply, of course. I just picked up the pace and focused on getting home. This guy gave me the chills, so I still left out that one headphone, just so I could be aware of my surroundings. I got about a quarter mile down the road and decided to look back to see if he was still sitting there. He wasn't, because he was now walking behind me, following me, basically and he was closing the distance. I swear my heart skipped a beat, and I remember thinking, no way is he following me, really? Maybe he lives up here. But that had to be his car at the park, so why is he going on foot? 
All these questions were flying through my mind. I looked back again, and he was even closer, walking at a much faster pace. Fight or flight kicked in, and I went from a casual stroll to a dead sprint instantly. I looked back once more. He had matched my pace and was now sprinting at me. For some reason, I decided to veer off the road, cutting through the forest. I sprinted over broken branches, through brush, diving into a bush, and going completely quiet. I could hear him stomping through the forest behind me. Then suddenly, he went quiet as well. I think he was trying to pinpoint where I was. This lasted a few minutes before I heard him start to go the other way, back to the park. I felt so relieved, thinking that he had given up. I still waited a few more minutes before he was out of the forest. Then I cut back through to the road as quietly as I could. Once I hit the pavement, I checked both ways just to be completely sure he wasn't there. There was no sign of him anywhere. Then again, I could only see about 40 feet in either direction because I was no longer in the main part of town and there were no street lamps here. I was still relieved because I was so certain that I'd lost him. So I just focused on getting back home. I was only about a mile away at that point. Eventually, I put my headphones back in and started to relax again, not even fully cluing in on what just happened. Eventually, I noticed a light coming up behind me, the headlights from a vehicle. My stomach sank as I was praying that it wasn't him. As it approached me, it slowed down. I practically cringed as it pulled up next to me and came to a full stop. I looked up, expecting to see that guy wielding a weapon and demanding that I get into the car. Thankfully, it wasn't him. It was a local guy around my age named Brent. He was on his way home from a get-together. Oh, hey, what's up, dude? I said. Nothing much, man. Do you need a ride home? He asked. But I was stupid. I replied, Nah, dude, it's all good. I'm almost home. Thanks the... I could then see a worried expression on his face as he cut me off and said, Are you sure, man? You know there's someone following you, right? I immediately looked down the road behind me. There he was. The same guy. He was closer than ever before. I could see something in his hands. Something that reflected from Brent's taillights. Turns out I had never lost him. He'd been following me, searching for me this whole time. I was completely oblivious, and I'd even put my headphones back in. I looked back at Brent. I didn't even say anything, and I scrambled into the truck. I didn't say a word during the ride. I couldn't stop thinking about how stupid I'd been. We soon pulled into my driveway, and I was never happier to see my house. As I was getting out of the truck, Brent jokingly said, I probably just saved you from being murdered. Well, he couldn't have been closer to the truth. The older I get, the scarier this experience becomes. What were the man's intentions? Was he going to try to kill me? Abduct me? Why was he in Elkton, Oregon, of all places? I'm glad I never found out. I stopped staying at my buddy's house so late after this experience, and I always kept one earbud out so I could be aware of my surroundings. No matter how much you think you know an area, or how safe you think it is, you should always be prepared for anything to happen. There are truly evil people and insane people in this world. Stay safe out there, everyone. Warning. The following story contains depictions of violence against pets. Creep on the trail. From Lady Skinwalker. I was 16 years old when this happened. I'm a five foot two girl with blonde hair, blue eyes. I've got two large dogs, Zanzibar, 
a Catahoula Pitbull mix, and Thingamajig, a Pitbull lab mix. I often take them on long walks through a hiking trail off leash. One day during our hike, a man approached me. He looked very average, around five foot nine, with brown hair and hazel eyes. He wore a basic gray t-shirt and dark blue jeans. He suddenly asked me if I had a lighter. I told him I didn't smoke, so I didn't have one on me. The man then looked me up and down and asked me for my name. Now, I didn't feel comfortable giving him my real name, so I simply told him my name was Kaya. He then asked about my age, and I answered him honestly then that I was 16. He also asked about my dogs, who at the moment were playing with each other behind me. After a few minutes of seemingly normal conversation, I tried to continue on my walk. He then began to tell me how he thought blondes were so hot and that blue eyes turned him on. I pushed past him, my dogs following playfully behind me. A few miles into the walk, I heard him screaming, Kaya, behind me. He ran up to me and said a woman who looked like me was calling my name and offered to come get me for her. I knew he was lying because I looked nothing like my mother and she wouldn't be calling me by that made-up name I gave him. I told him I knew he was lying and I would not go with him. My dogs, who were playing with a stick, came closer to me after hearing me raise my voice. As I turned to gather my dogs and continue my walk, he grabbed me and he shoved something sharp and cold right into my back. What happened next happened so fast. My dogs began barking. The man let go of me. Zanzibar yelped, and I heard heavy footsteps running away. I started to have a panic attack, but I guess adrenaline kicked in. I got up and ran to Zanzibar, who had also been stabbed. It was a knife. He'd shoved a knife in my back. Thingamajig was running after the man, but came back after realizing the guy had left me alone. I was able to throw Zanzibar over my shoulder and speed walk home. Don't worry, Zanzibar is okay now, but I've since dyed my hair black. I just couldn't look at my hair anymore without remembering what happened. Even now as I write this, I feel a panic attack coming on. Whenever I walk my dogs, I still think about what would have happened if my dogs weren't such good boys. I also no longer take that route, and I soon found out I wasn't the first girl he had done this to. Everyone, be careful and aware of people, because there are horrible people out there. If you live in southern Louisiana, watch out if you go hiking. This man is still not arrested. Thank you for stopping by at our little campsite here at Camping Horrors. To hear your story on the show, send it to us for narration at darkstories.org. For more narrations from me, you can catch me on my other podcasts, Unexplained Encounters, and Tales from the Break Room on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Or you can go to eeriecast.com for those and even more terrifying podcasts. Follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Dark Prevails, and be sure to leave Camping Horrors a rating and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Now then, I'll see you soon when the campfire blazes once again.